Good morning. It's the 21st Sunday after Pentecost, and we're so glad you could be here with us. We're continuing with our consecrated stewards, and we have Pastor Micah Glenn, who is serving in mission in Ferguson, Missouri, and he's come to speak with us this morning. We've got one announcement. Next Thursday, the 25th, we're serving the soup kitchen, so next Sunday, the, the recipe cards and the dishes that we use to serve those meals will be down where they usually are in the front of the sanctuary. We're going to begin with our opening hymn. Please rise. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Lord, merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. 
for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Old Testament reading comes from Amos, the fifth chapter. (laughs) Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour with none to quench it for Bethel. O you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth, they hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him, You have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe, and turn aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you, as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. This is the word of the Lord.
Our epistle reading is from Hebrews, the third chapter. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence from to, firm to the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. As Jesus was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. This is the word of the Lord. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. be seated. As was said at the beginning of the service, we're continuing in our Consecrated Stewards Month, and this week we get to hear from Mrs. Gasser. She's going to tell us her Holy Cross story. My Holy Cross story. My name is Brenda Gasser. I was born in 1956. I am 62 years old. I have been at Holy Cross since I was born. I was baptized at this font. I went to Holy Cross school, kindergarten through eighth grade. I was confirmed and graduated by Pastor Bizarro in 1970. I then went to Collinsville High School. There was no Lutheran High School yet. Then after high school, I went to the St. Louis College of Pharmacy. I graduated there in 1980. It was a five-year program, but it took me six years. From the age of 16, I worked for my dad at Evers Pharmacy on Main Street in Collinsville until I became a pharmacist at age 25. I then worked as a pharmacist for seven years for dad. Uh, I went to pharmacy school because my dad needed help. Uh, 
Uh, he had had cancer when he was 47 years old, and uh, probably at age 62, looking back over my life, I probably would have become a teacher, and I solved that problem throughout my life uh, of the teaching. But anyway, I, I was a pharmacist. I was educated as a pharmacist, and uh, that education has helped me in many situations in my lifetime. Uh, I probably only did pharmacy for 18 years. Uh, but anyway, I was taught at an early age, at age 16, by dad, that, and that's how I became a people person. He taught me that when a person came in that front door at the business, you look at that person's face, and then you connect a name with that person's face. And sooner or later, when that person comes into your business, you will be able to call that person by name. That made many relationships for me in my lifetime, whether it's Collinsville, Holy Cross, Barnes Hospital, wherever it is. At age 27, Greg Gasser and I got married here at Holy Cross in 1983 by Pastor Bizarro. We have three daughters. Mary's gonna be 30 later this month. Judy's 27 and Catherine is 21. My dear Catherine, uh, she's been my blessing living at home yet because I was 41 when I had her. So 41, 21, we're 62. All my children were baptized here at this font and they all went to Holy Cross and then we sent them to Metro East Lutheran High School. The best money that we could have ever spent and we sacrificed many years in to send them to that school, but the best education they could have ever gotten. I encourage the girls to what do what makes them happy. Remember, Mama didn't follow that path. She became a pharmacist. And I've been criticized over the years for, push, for not pushing them into careers where they could make lots of money. Of course, there were many years I chose not the money and to take care of the children. Mary and Judy went to SIU uh, in Edwardsville, and they became teachers. Mary teaches down at Christ the King at the Lake uh, Lutheran School at Lake Ozark, Missouri. And Judy teaches drama and theater at Ferg in the ferguson Florissant School District. Her first three years, she was at Berkeley Middle School, and now this last two years, she's been at McClure South Berkeley High School. Huh, they've been in the news twice this week. Uh, she's also involved in theater and drama program up at the Lutheran High School for six years. Then there's my Catherine. Catherine didn't want to do, have anything to do with those bachelor's degrees. So we sent her to Chesterfield to Petropolis because she wanted to become a dog groomer. She works on Chippewa in St. Louis at a walk in the park. Now I'm going to talk about a little of Pastor Wright's article that he put in the messenger last month. Let's talk about God who made me. He made all of us and all the things that I have and all the things that he has given to all of us. Everything comes from God. He gives me the ability to think, to breathe, to be put on my feet, and to put those feet on the floor. Well, I did that this morning too. Uh, maybe a little more than I wanted to. He's also given me enough energy and stamina to stand. We can't take these simple things of life for granted because as easy as he gives them, them to us, he can also take it away. It is God's grace that we have what we have and we can do what we can do. God loves us a whole lot and I love God a whole lot. And he gave us Jesus who died for us and came alive, again, uh, came alive for us. And someday we will be able to live with him in heaven. Every Sunday for 48 years, I sing with my little cherubs. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I did it again this Sunday. Last Sunday, I was not that fortunate. I was too weak to be here, so my daughters taught for me. I'm going to tell you about my life with Jesus and how I serve him at Holy Cross. God's given me these blessings and gifts, and I share them with my family, with my Holy Cross congregation, with my friends, with people I meet everywhere. I have made many relationships, and I have had many opportunities sorry, uh, to help and support many people. 
I live out my faith in Jesus to connect with others in struggles, good times, bad times in our lives. I listen to lots of people. I even talk to lots of people about how things that I'm going through. So here are the things that I've done. I've told you I've taught these 48 years. I was only 14 when I started teaching Sunday school here at Holy Cross to three-year-olds and did that for years and years till Mrs. Yago uh, had her accident. And then I took on the parents and twos. And now, like this morning, I have 18 months old, 20 months old babies, but they all can put their hands together to pray and they can open their hands because it's the Bible. And so that is how I took care of the teaching that I didn't go and be educated at. I've been on the board of worship and probably now 10 to 12 years. Earlier in my married life, I did maybe four years with the board of worship uh, years ago. But as the kids got older, that is what I have taken on is this sanctuary and all the things that go with the board of worship. And everybody wants to know, how are you so detail oriented? I was trained as a pharmacist. Would you want pink pills in your bottle when you were supposed to get blue pills? No, <laughs> these are the things that, I know where the locks are, where the, the, where, how you turn on the lights, uh, I, I, how you hang the banners, whatever it is, I have learned over those last 12 years doing the board of worship. Seven years ago, I started up the senior service. It had gone by the wayside, and it was something that should have never gone by the wayside, but I started it up. So for the last seven years, every second Wednesday of the month at 11 a.m., we have church for seniors. Uh, and, and every month it's different, and every month it's a different quantity. Remember, I told you I wasn't here on Sunday, but I was here on Wednesday because Wednesday was the second Wednesday of the month. I have a list of, seven, of 100 seniors. I look at that list every month and I go over those people's names and I think, okay, have I seen them? Have I not seen them? Have they been here? Haven't they been here? Has their life changed that I need to talk to them? I try to call at least 35, sometimes up to 50 people. It just depends. Not everyone gets a call every month. Depends on their situation. Holy Cross is an association member of the Metro East Lutheran High School. I don't know if you all realize that, but we donate money to the Lutheran High School every month. Holy Cross sends two representatives to sit on the board uh, of directors at Metro East Lutheran High School. I have sat on the board now for eight years. Best high school in the whole world. I know people will tell you it's expensive. I know it is, but there are ways in this world to sacrifice so your children can go there. So it doesn't matter if I'm changing a seasonal bulletin board, if I'm cooking and serving a Lent and Advent meal, if I'm being here for a funeral service held here in the church, if I'm working apple butter, and by the way, I did not do that this year, worship mart, if I'm sitting with someone who is dying, we all have talents that God has given us. I can't fix plumbing, I can't fix electricity around here but I use what God has given to me to help others. It's part of my being, it's how I was raised. So until I take my last breath here on earth, I will continue to do what I am able and capable to do. Now the story has this big change in it. We had just finished eight church services during Holy Week. Easter was on April 1st. I was not feeling good. Every time I unlocked those front glass doors and I'd walk up the steps, I was short of breath. I'd have to sit down and get my air back. My abdomen was aching. Uh, on April 3rd, I went to the first doctor, and then I went to the big GI doctor on April 18th. I thought I had pancreatitis again, but no, that doctor sat across from me, and he said the first word out of his mouth was metastasize. When I heard metastasize, he didn't even have to say cancer. I knew. He said I had metastasize metastasized spots on my liver and on my lungs and he said we have to find out where they're coming from okay um, these metastasized spots are coming from my endometrial lining uh, cancer cells that are living on my liver and my lungs they think these female cancer cells think my liver and my lungs is their house well anyway first week of May I started chemotherapy I've had eight chemo treatments so far. You put toxic drugs in your body, you get toxic side effects. I now deal with neuropathy in my feet and my fingers. 
that was why I had my little ditty ditty on the floor this morning. Anyway, in six months, my life has changed drastically and dramatically. It is hard to absorb all the information that my life has changed in that six months, but I know I have to fight daily to stay strong as I can be if I'm going to stay alive. And I have to, uh, some days I'm not strong enough and I have to stay in the chair all day and I have to rest and do what I have to do. If there is energy in my body, I do what I'm capable of doing. I thank God for all the little blessings daily uh, because there were times when I would have taken all of that for granted. Now I told you I have sat at many people's bed when they have been dying. And of course, if I do that, I would say the three verses of I am Jesus' little lamb. This morning, I'm just going to tell you the third verse because I'm the lamb in that picture. Who is who so happy as I am, even now the shepherd's lamb? And when my short life is ended, by his angel host attended, he shall fold me to his breast, there within his arms to rest. Please share your talents with all of us at Holy Cross. We need your service. Please, please bring those inactive members of Holy Cross back with you to join us in our pews. God wants to bless them and wants to hear their worship and praise. Please bring your children to Sunday school so they can sing Jesus Loves Me with me, their Sunday school teacher. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak and to listening to me. This is part of my Holy Cross story. together and confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty. be seated.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God that engages us this morning comes from our Old Testament reading, uh, focusing on the first two verses. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and it devour with none to quench it, quench it for Bethel. O you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth. So for the, the past uh, two weeks of life, I've been at home uh, with my two oldest children. Uh, my, my wife's father had a heart attack almost a month ago. Uh, they're missionaries in the Dominican Republic, uh, but they're now home. And so my wife drove out to Pittsburgh with our youngest son uh, to help take care of her dad. Uh, and so it, I rarely find myself in a position when I'm at home by myself with the kids. I, I usually have my better half there to keep things intact, sane, uh, organized, uh, whatever you have it. My kids fed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, my oldest son is five, and you know, thankfully now he's, he's getting at that point in life where he's trying to be a little more autonomous. And so for the last two weeks when I failed to get up and make breakfast on time, which for my kids is usually in between 5.30 and 6.00, uh, he's taken it upon himself uh, to get milk and cereal and bowls for him and his sister. Uh, and it's given me the luxury uh, of sleeping in until like, what, 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but Tuesday, we had a, a late evening. Uh, we got home. I do the things that I do on late evenings. I, I took my keys, my wallet, my watch, and I put them on the counter, uh, put the kids to bed. I went to bed. And then when I woke up uh, on Wednesday, uh, we get ready for school. <clears throat> I, I brush my daughter's hair, which I'm also not great at that. Uh, it's always, I did it in the garage one day, and she was like screaming for her life. And I, I, I thought to myself, what are the neighbors thinking is going inside this garage? Uh, so I always do it in the house now. Uh, <laughs> so, so we get up, we get ready, and it, it's time to leave. And I, I grab my wallet, I, I put my watch on, and I go to grab the keys, and they're gone. Uh, and talking to my son Jonathan, him and my daughter have decided to play hide and seek with my keys. Um, and so I, I can't call out to my keys and say, where are you? Uh, you know, and we're not bright enough to have like a little beeper on keys either. And so I, I sit them down and, and the court begins and I begin to interrogate them on where these keys are. And they, they send me on a wild goose chase around the house. Now I'm starting to look uh, Why well, I looked first where they told me they would be. Uh, started in Jonathan's room, then Talitha's room, then the drawers of the, the cabinet in the bathroom, then in the cabinet itself, I looked in the shower, uh, I looked around everywhere I could think to look. I, I, I began to look in places I know they can't reach, but kids can surprise you sometimes. Maybe they're there. And then now that I'm angry and frustrated and on the verge of spanking my children, uh, I take a deep breath. And, and lo and behold, the keys are probably in the spot where I, I should have looked first, dead smack in the middle of our living room. It's, it's interesting that when we're looking for something that we know that we need, uh, that we need in life, how often do you find yourself first looking in the most unlikely spots? You, you, we, we turn to the places that are difficult, that are going to challenge us, and we look there first. And it's on a very rare occasion that when we're seeking for something, desperately seeking for something, that we begin in the obvious place, the, the place right in front of us, this glaring at us, this screaming at us, this begging us, uh, inviting us to come and see it. <laughs> in our Old Testament lesson, uh, we find the people of God in a, a likely position, uh, in a, a state of, of, of anarchy and chaos, uh, of disobedience, of idolatry. And God has called the prophet Amos to speak to his people. And so by now, the kingdom of Israel has been split. Uh, the different tribes can no longer get along with each other. They, they no longer worship the same way. 
Uh, they're constantly at battle with each other. They're constantly being invaded by foreign invaders. And of course, in these scenarios, uh, with chaos and anarchy comes suffering. It comes a lack of justice. There comes a time for self-preservation. And now I'm a missionary in Ferguson. And now four years ago, we were all witness, at least via the news, of what was going on, at least from a distance, uh, maybe a little veiled by our, our media sources. But nonetheless, out of, out of that time, uh, the people came up with a lot of slogans that were chanted. And, and now putting motive aside, uh, desired outcome aside, there's one that has stuck with me, that'll most likely now stick with me for the rest of my life. And one of those slogans was, no justice, no peace. And now let that really resonate within yourself. No justice, no peace. Because motives aside, that slogan is true. Where there is no justice, where there's inequality and inequity and chaos and anarchy and all these other things and abuses of power, where there's no justice, there cannot be peace. But here comes the challenge for us living in the world here and now, is where do we seek to find justice in this world? Where do we look for it? Where do we locate it? Who do we look out to? Who do we trust to exercise justice in a way that benefits everybody? Because this is also the harsh reality. When justice is executed in this world, somebody has to lose. Meaning that in any courtroom, there's always a winner, there's always a loser, no matter what scenario you find. And when somebody's a loser <laughs> in a justice system, Rarely uh, does it end in, in a scenario where people are okay with it, at least where everybody is okay with it. In fact, when justice is executed for us now, it, it seems to divide bigger chasms between the two people. And, and so now we find Israel, the people of God, God's children, in a scenario where justice has been lost. Justice has been abused in the nation of Israel. Now, you know, I, I wasn't a, a first-hand uh, eyewitness, uh, but I, I assume the people in authority were exercising justice in a way that first benefited them, uh, meaning the king was in self-preservation mode, the high priest and um, whoever else who's supposed to, you know, sacrifice for people begin to uh, abuse that as well. And, and of course, now again, we're left with the people who are subordinate common people, people like us, beginning to ask the question, where's the justice? Where is the, the justice from us? Where are we supposed to turn when the people who are, we're supposed to trust in this world, who have power and authority, aren't exercising the justice of God in a way that's fair for everybody? Uh, because this, this is true, God's justice does have a winner and a loser, but when he exercises it for us, we're on the winning side. Is this ever going to stop? I don't know. It's throwing me off. I, I would like to pretend like it's not bothering me, but, but I am imperfect. And so, as people were marching in the streets of Ferguson and asking for justice, the Department of Justice now, the United States, began investigating our community, top to bottom, government. And after their investigation, uh, through studies, through statistics and things like that, they found our government guilty of systemic racism. And so you would expect in a, in a justice decision, the government loses, the community wins. But the government is a part of our community. It, it's, a very, it, it's supposed to be a, a function of our community that, that serves the people, that has their best interest at heart. And, and now that we have these executive legislations passed on to our community, all it's doing is making it more difficult. All it's doing is creating more barriers, more doorways that people have to, and hoops for people to jump through and walk through to, to get the things that they need. It hasn't cleaned anything up. 
Because this is the truth, brothers and sisters in Christ. This world, any government, any prince, any ruler, any president, any one of us left to our own devices cannot execute justice in a fair way. There is no justice in this world for you or me apart from the justice of God. His holy, divine, perfect justice. Because when it came to, to justice being executed over us, and, and you see when justice has in fact been executed over us, and when it's sought and where it's found, when, it, when it's sought properly and we look for it in the right place, justice gives life. It gives equity. It, it, it gives a, a veil for us to see things rightly in the world. It makes us righteous. It gives us the ability to stand up before God in all of the holiness that he offers. And when he executed that justice, there was, in fact, losers and winners. But the losers in that scenario wasn't us, despite the fact that we are sinners. We, we do seem to have the tendency to be determined to turn away from God on a constant and consistent basis to disobey him and to be sinful in our nature. But when God executed his justice over the world, the loser was his son. Jesus allowed himself to be found guilty in our place. And he allowed himself to die a true sinner's death. In that moment where Jesus gave up his life, he took your sins, he took my sins, he took the sins of the world upon himself. And he took those sins into the grave. So now the loser in God's justice is sin and death and the devil instead of you and me. We get to be on the side of the coin that is the winner, that is right that is good because we have a loving and gracious God who cares for us, who loves us. And we have now, uh, in, in the spirit of stewardship, we have this beautiful gift called the gospel. And within this gospel pa package comes all things. It comes eternal life. It comes God's love, his mercy, his grace, and also his justice. His justice that brings peace and rest and civility to this world. The only challenge for you and me is that it's, it's a foreign concept to the world. And in fact, it's something that the, the world rejects because justice, doesn't, justice according to God doesn't look according to the world. An innocent man dying for people who aren't innocent, the world wouldn't call that justice. They would call it a mistake. But for you and me, that's the key. Uh, that's the key uh, of how we move forward because we take this gift. And, 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 you know, a lot of times when we think of stewardship, we think of, you know, nickel and diming and saving. But you can't overshare the gospel. You can't overshare the justice of God. The, the, the cup is bottomless. It is ever flowing. It never ends. And it comes to a time as we go out, you know, people in the world, they're looking for this. They're looking for hope. Uh, they're looking for a new way of life. They're looking for justice. But they're looking for it in all the wrong places. Because if you want to find God's justice, if you want some peace in your life, if you want rest, you don't go looking for it in the world. You look for it here, amongst your brothers and sisters in Christ. The places where God has promised to be, in his word, in his baptism, in the supper, and confession, and absolution. Where two or three are gathered in his name, you find God and his justice. And so again, uh, justice brings peace. No justice, no peace. And I said, this, this does, in fact, look different. Uh, uh, in our building, most times people come into our building that I, I share space with looking for financial assistance. And on one particular day, I wasn't there. Uh, uh, but, I, but I have done something 
rather clever. People have been bringing books to me to, to share with kids in our community. And I had a bookshelf in my office because I, I also had books that, that people, they, they weren't age appropriate. And I, I wanted to, I didn't want to send them back. I didn't want to throw them away. What do you do with them? I put a bookshelf in, in the entryway uh, for people to be able to take. And, and on one of those shelves, I, I've been putting Bibles. Uh, and, and the Bibles go the quickest. And, and to the point where now people come into our building asking if this is the place where they get free Bibles. Uh, it, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, but on this particular day, a, a young, uh, not a, a young woman, an, an older woman from our community who was a widow came in looking for help, uh, looking for a means of, of relief uh, from her financial dis distress and, and things like that. And, and at the time, everybody else there didn't have the money to help her. And, and I've, I've built a, a great relationship with the building manager. His name is Tarkus. And uh, Tarkus said, Pastor, I, I didn't want the woman to leave empty handed. I didn't have anything to give her per se. But but I, I just tried to think of, of what you would do, which was a, a extremely humbling moment for me, because I, I think what he thought of was better than what I would have thought of. And he took this woman to the bookcase and he hands her a Bible and he prays for her. Now, this is what I'm talking about. I know that God's justice was exercised. We can call it whatever we want. Love, mercy, grace. I know his justice was exercised because in that moment of prayer, in that moment of being recognized as a, another person, in that moment of somebody else showing compassion, this woman found peace in her life. She found comfort in the fact that she wasn't alone in this world. No justice, no peace. That's something that as children of God and brothers and sisters in Christ, that we have to constantly have on our hearts and constantly be looking forward to as we go out into the world sharing this beautiful gift with everybody around us. So without God's justice in their life, they cannot have peace. Now may that same peace of God which surpasses all understanding Keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.